Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Logistics with Purpose. I'm genuinely excited today because we're going to be talking about a topic that's very unique uh, and with someone that knows a lot, a lot about uh, this animal. So that I'll, she'll tell us a little more in a second. But before, before I do that, let me just introduce you all to E.C. Sot, behavioral researcher at Apopo, and she's in Tanzania right now. E.C., how are you doing? Good morning. I'm good. Good afternoon. How are you? <laughs> well, thank you. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> morning to everyone in this side of the world, and it uh, could be evening, morning, or uh, uh, yeah, afternoon for <laughs> a lot of people listening to us. So <laughs> thanks for coming to the show. This is amazing. Thank you for having me. Well, before we deep dive into what you do and what your organization does, which is amazing, could you tell us a little bit more about, about yourself? Tell us a little bit more about where you grew up and how was your childhood like? So I'm uh, based in Tanzania in Morogoro, um, but I am originally from Germany. Um, I grew up in Heidelberg, which is a, a smallish town in the southwest of Germany. Um, and, um, you know, grew up, um, always loved being outdoors and, 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 you know, always had pets. Um, but I did a lot of dancing growing up um, and horseback riding. So really enjoyed those things. Did school because I had to. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all did that, I guess. We all did. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and um, when I when I finished school, I, I, I was a bit lost in, in terms of what to do next. Um, there were many, many opportunities and none of them seemed particularly right. So I did a lot of internships and volunteering and travel. Um, and during my travel, did a lot of work with animals um, and really, you know, discovered that that is what I wanted to do for a living. Um, so the, so then the, love, I, the love for pets and you said that you had some pets yeah. where they're like, dogs mm -hmm. cats or you had other types of animals too i and we mostly had cats um you know lots of my best friends had dogs um but the horseback riding you know growing up in stables you've got lots of dogs and obviously the horses and donkeys uh, around um so yeah um all sorts and i used to follow my cat around the neighbor's gardens um which was a bit of an, <laughs> an odd thing to do as a kid um but yeah you'd encounter all sorts of things there um well it sounds like yeah. sounds, well it sounds like you've always had something like a connection like a special connection special bond with animals uh do you remember something like a cool story uh when you were younger um that kind of started to give you some hints about well this is probably something i should do the rest of my life no um not, not, yeah, not, like, not really no it no. was it really I came to I, I you know when I was very little I wanted to be a vet um and then realized that that you know comes along with uh having to put animals down and you know a lot of heartbreak and I was like no actually I don't really want to do this so um you know I think having animals in my life always sort of fulfilled that need for me to not actually question it much further um and then, you know, when I traveled I, I, and did all these internships and I did internships in hotels and with the radio and um, all of that stuff. And it just wasn't right. Um, and I never felt like I was getting the same thing back that I was getting when, when you're interacting with an animal. Um, and, you know, traveling and seeing animals across the world in the wild was just so fascinating. And, and you know, of course... Um, having that passion for it, you know, getting involved in conservation and, and you know, trying to do more there um, really was something that showed me that's that's where I want to go. I really want to do this full time um, and not just, you know, have it on the side. I, and it sounds like you not only kind of like the animals, but the behavior. I mean, you were very interested in, in their behavior, right? Tell us a little bit more about that side of the, I guess, your uh, interest in, in animals in general. I think it's a funny thing because often, you know, when you have pet, pets, um, it's very clear to you when your pet wants something. Um, and, and, you know, when your pet looks at you a certain way and you're like, mm -hmm, it's time to go outside yes, or, you know, yes, OK, absolutely. you're getting hungry. Um, but actually, it's quite, you know, pets can't speak human. So it's, it, it's quite interesting when you try and quantify these behaviors into something that, you know, is valid across species or even, you know, for, within a species. Um, so 
and and of course you know if you're surrounded by people who share your opinion that's you know right. yeah, of course they right. have a personality but then at some point you will meet people who are like no pets don't animals don't have personalities and you know we should we don't need to care so much and um they're so wrong and they're, yeah <laughs> <Clearly>. <laughs> <Obviously>. <laughs> i i have a dog and love animals too so i'm biased uh-huh. like you but uh, yes <laughs> They definitely have personalities. How can they yes, say something like that? Absolutely. Um, but that's, I think, where, where, where the science comes in. And, right. you know, like doing the, the job, doing it as a job is, you know, we're able to prove that animals have personalities now because, you know, really got, got down in the numbers and testing it over and over again and saying, well, look, here are the hard numbers. If you don't believe in the, you know, emotional, you're making this upside, um, then, you know, the data. don't argue with the numbers. Exactly. Um, so I think that was something that, that you know, going into animal behavior as a, as a topic really brought these two together. Um, I love to argue. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good thing to have as well. You know, you, you're now arguing your point and your passion. Um, and, and yeah, that just really sort of fascinated me. And I, you know, after school, when I took this time to travel and do internships, I, I came to university a little bit late, but um, throughout my degree, I never had a doubt that I was doing the right thing. Um, so what, that, did you, that, what did you uh, study? Where did you? I studied, um, I did a bachelor's degree in animal behavior. Um, so I did um, all my university degrees in the UK, um, in, in England, up in Liverpool, which is an amazing city. Um, and from that bachelor's degree, which was quite broad, it was more about, you know, how do we quantify animal behavior? How do we measure it? How do we record it and observe it? And, you know, what experiments can we do? And everything that goes in with that. Um, I then did a master's degree where I studied um, rhesus macaques, um, which are a monkey. They're, they're quite commonly used for research, for biomedical research. Um, if you've ever been to Thailand or Southeast Asia, you will probably have encountered them in the temples. Um, and I worked with these monkeys and um, trained them to look at different pictures to see how their attention to these images changes depending on how they were feeling. Oh, um, wow. And that was all part of developing a tool to measure welfare changes, to be able to pick up on when does my animal uh, start to not feel so well and, and be able to tell that early enough so that we can... Based on the pictures uh, that they were looking at? Yes. Um, so basically wow, what we did is we showed them two pictures at the same time. And one of them was um, a, a conspecific, so another monkey that they didn't know with a relatively neutral facial expression. And the other one is a threat face. And based on how you're feeling, it's kind of, uh, it, we humans have this as well. Uh, it follows the principle of if you get up on the wrong side, um, you know, you, everything goes wrong that day. Yes. Everything, you know, from there, it's just downwards. And it's because... If you are in that mindset, you're more likely to focus on these negative things and it just spirals from there. And we all have this and, you know, it changes between days. But if, you know, if you are not able to get out of this spiral, your your welfare state will deteriorate. Um, well, that's and, what they're you know, saying, that you're bringing up all those negative things to you, but you're not really bringing them to you. You're just the mindset and then you're focusing on the things and making them exactly, exactly. exponentially worse. Exactly. So that's what we looked at with the monkeys is like, which of these pictures are you focusing on today? And is it different tomorrow? Or um, is it the same? And can we use that to pinpoint when there's a change? And can we use that to say uh, that something's happening here, we need to pay more attention to this animal um, and and do something now before it gets too late. Um, So that was a a really interesting project. um, and, And, you know, very very interesting to work with a wild animal in captivity with these monkeys in captivity um and and you know clicker train them like they loved us because we just came in with these pictures and all they had to do is sit there and look at them they got lots of peanuts (laughs) and raisins for it um so for them it was just like a game that they would do with us and and you know it was very very rewarding work do you um, um do you feel like the more you study all these different animals, the more you understand humans? <laughs> Is that you're like, oh, maybe I can extract this from them and now I have better understanding think, of me as a person or as some friend of those or someone? Definitely. I think there's a lot of concepts that you know apply across the board. Um, you know, understanding how our hormones affect us and you know how our cognition and, and intention affects uh, how we're coping with the world and you know what like what what does it mean to cope and when is it a good thing and 
you know, when is that influence of having to cope all the time actually getting bad? Um, it definitely helps you understand. Like, I had situations where I was like, oh, this is why I like I to tidy up when yes. I'm stressed. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah, so definitely. Uh, I mean, my I, I used to work at a restaurant and my boss there used to um, call me an animal psychologist. Um, and, you know, um, there are so many things in our lives that we share with animals uh, and so many experiences that we share with other animals that, um, of course, there are um, things that you can, you know, relate to yourself or to people that you know, you know, the whole alpha thing. Is, uh, <laughs> <you> know, <you laughs> that, that, that could be a completely uh, new episode, uh-huh. right? I mean, we'll probably have to reschedule <laughs> another session for you to talk about that. Yes, but absolutely. tell us. So after after you were studying these monkeys, um, mm-hmm. what brought you slowly to the position with a popo, and kind of what made that connection? So after I did my masters, I did a PhD, um, and there I actually went the opposite direction in terms of size of the animal and studied elephants. Um, and I was looking at um, safari tourism. So if you were to go on a safari in Africa and you're going out like in a big game drive vehicle and you're taking pictures. What does that do to elephants? Um, and is is the number of tourism that is happening in the area? Does it present a stressor? Is it you know can it be stressful if there's a lot of this happening? Um, so that was very different because it was with wild elephants. Um, so I didn't interact with them or try to train them. Um, wow. I was just out there observing what they were doing and um, tracking their movements across the reserve. I collected a whole lot of elephant poo for hormone analyses, (laughs) (laughs) a whole chest freezer full um, to look at their stress hormones um, and all of that. So that really was, you know, working like in in a game reserve in South Africa and and being based there and and working with a wild animal in the wild. But I mean, I think all of it came together with, you know, trying to do something that has a purpose and that, um, you know, is meaningful work uh, that results in in learning something that can that can help in in some kind of way. And of course, like for my for my study degrees, it was very much focused on how can we help these species, whereas what I am doing now is more how can these how can this specific species I'm working with now help us um, or help other animals. But yeah, I think that that's that's a theme that that was always quite present and something that was always personally important to me to, to have this purpose um, in in my job. Which that switch is kind of like what connected uh, us uh, with you and your organization. And you'll see everyone that's listening so far. They're like, well, supply chain. Where is this coming <laughs> into play? And and it will. I mean, just give us another second. Uh, EC is going to take us there. And uh, so. And now a popo, right? So you went from the monkeys, you went to the <laughs> bigger animals, the elephants uh, in South Africa. And so you're getting closer and closer. Did you know at this time that you wanted to shift gears a little bit and start helping humans as opposed to animals or not yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, g- please go from the beginning. <laughs> go, go on, because I would like to hear a little bit more about how that happened. I think um, I finished my PhD um, just about as like a little bit before the pandemic hit. Um, So it was a tough time to try and find a job. Um, So I was there and I, you know, I had my passion for for Africa and for conservation and, and, you know, seeking for this position that fulfills some kind of purpose. Um, So in in all my job seeking that I did, I came across the the position of behavioral researcher at Apopo. Um, and a popo for you know I don't think we've mentioned this yet but no um, please go is ahead. A, tell us more about what it is so we're a Belgian NGO um, and we are um, mainly based uh, our biggest base is here in Tanzania where I am now and we train African giant pouch rats for a whole range of humanitarian purposes so we're most famous and known for our rats that are detecting landmines um, and, and other explosives. Um, a lot of this work is done in, in Cambodia, for example, but we are also working in uh, Zimbabwe. We have been in Mozambique, which is now landmine free. Um, so, you know, that was the, the, original, the original rat um, was detecting TNT. Um, and since then, over the past few years, Apopo added things to this because really what we are working with is training these rats as scent detection animals. 
um, and they have an amazing sense of smell. Um, it's you know very comparable to that of dogs, um, but our rats are a bit smaller and lighter. So for the landmines, for example, that means that they can safely walk across this field where the landmines are buried, and they are too light to set any landmines off. So you know, instead of a human going in with a metal detector and the metal detector, you know, indicates every piece of scrap metal, uh, it's, it's tedious work. Our rats are only going for TNT and they can happily walk back and forth and back and forth and back and They're forth. They're not in danger of exploding or anything like that, which is exactly. great. Dogs would probably set this line mines off as well, right? Yes, so we also work with dogs um, in, in areas that are more overgrown and bushy. Um, so, of course, for our rats, you know, we need to be able to access it with them. Um, but dogs are usually trained that if they detect it, they will sit um, near it, they, you know. Um, and with dogs, again, you're, you're very, very careful at keeping their body weight right. um, at, at that limit where they are safe as well, of course. So yeah. Well, so you 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 saw this uh, announcement. There were there was a potential opportunity there to work with them. Did you just immediately jumped in? Did you talk to someone? I mean, how did you start it to shift your mindset from animals to rats? I mean, it's like another big shift, right? Mm -hmm. I think I you know obviously um, you know did a lot of research on the organization and and Glassdoor and. <laughs> All of these things and you know trying to figure out like what, what can I learn and and where would I fit in um and and the position very clearly advertised for the innovation department which I'm a part of now um so um we have this active program with our rats detecting the landmines um we also have an active program with our rats detecting tuberculosis which until very recently was you know the, the biggest disease factor here in, in in the world and it's only been overtaken by covid um so uh, you know our rats scan sputum samples from from humans um and when they detect the bacteria um, of tuberculosis they tell us about it they indicate it to us um so we how, are working how they, with how they indicate i mean do they i mean dogs sit you mentioned that dogs mm -hmm. sit next to the line mm -hmm. how how do rats tell you <laughs> indicate it depends yeah. on the project um so our landmine detection rats um will scratch the surface when they detect oh. a landmine buried they will scratch on the surface Whereas our tuberculosis rats work in a, in a, in a cage that Apopo has custom designed for this, where we have the samples placed in the bottom in little holes, um, and the rat evaluates one after the other by sticking its nose in the hole and sniffing it. And if it detects tuberculosis, all it does is hold its nose there for a certain amount of seconds. And then you'll so that's all. sample. Exactly. And then we go and double screen the sample. Uh, if we find it to be positive, we send it back to our partner clinic to then inform the patients and say, hey, you know, we've, you know, we've right. detected tuberculosis and then and, and that's it and we can now treat you. So that's the other active department. Um, but then the innovation department and then what I applied for was to, I mean, for one, help these existing departments and, and do research into how can we make this even better and what else, you know, can we do to improve it? Um, but also what else can we do with our rats? Right. You know, um, what, what other options are there? We, you know, um, my boss is inundated with emails all the time about people suggesting things yeah, can you, what can our rats do, can right. do. <laughs> um, and, you know, that there are a lot of projects that are running and that are up and running that, um, we're now doing this research on to see, you know, where, where can we go next? Um, what could be our next program? Could you, could you share a little bit of those uh, projects or I projects? don't want you to disclose anything that you cannot disclose, <laughs> but it sounds like they can do so much more. It's already incredible what they're doing with both tuberculosis and detecting landmines, but it sounds like they're smart, they're capable, they're curious, yeah. you mentioned. Yes. Um, I think as long as something has a, a unique scent profile or odor profile and we can figure out how to bring it to our rats and train them they'll do it um wow. you know the challenge is really on us to figure out the best way to train our rats and, and and support them um in their learning but some of the projects we are running um and, and developing is um for example training our rats to detect survivors in collapsed buildings um following natural disasters um, so what you will find often is that, you know, the buildings collapse and you have these small little crevices that we can't really access. And what we envision is that our rats 
can access these. Um, we've got a whole high tech backpack that they are wearing um, with a camera and tracking them and hopefully two way audio and all these things to go in and tell us if they find a person in the debris so we can rescue them. So that's one of the projects. Um, and then we've got the next project, which is training our rats for wildlife detection. Um, so there's a lot of illegal trade of poached wildlife. Um, and a lot of this happens through international shipping ports and shipping containers. So traffickers will be you know, concealing um, ivory or rhino horn, um, pangolin scales, you know, protected hardwoods um, in those shipping containers and then trade them internationally. Um, and, and the idea is there again, that our rats are small, we can send them into a packed container without having to unload all of it. Right. Um, and we're also exploring the opportunity for our rats to um, be lifted to the ventilation system of these containers and actually just sniff the vent and tell us there's something in there or not. So it removes the need to open this container in the first place, um, which would immensely help screening those, you know, billions of shipping containers right. that are going back and forth all across the world. And it's such a race to try and keep up with it and, and, and screen them. I believe a lot so of ports are already trying this, right? Oh, oh there he is. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. Who, who's that little guy? That's Maisie. That's Maisie. Maisie. Yeah, I've got a cat and a giant dog. I've locked so, one of the dog outside <laughs> um, in hopes that there wouldn't be any havoc, but there we go. Well, I, that just prompted another question for you, but it will probably derail us a little bit from where we're going. So I'll ask it later. Uh, Macy living among all those different rats. I wonder if that's <laughs> how that's working. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I, I've heard ports are actually using this because it's, it's very accurate. It's a lot cheaper to maintain, uh, I guess, a rat than scanning the containers. And I think that could be the future, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, you know, the existing methods to scan these shipping containers um, are x-ray machines, um, where you have the issue that, first of all, they're expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, they can tell you that the material inside is organic or not. Um, but, it, you know, if somebody, you know, traffickers like to hide stuff, so they will do things like um, sealing elephant ivory inside wooden logs. Right. Um, and, you know, it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, the x-rays would never really get it. Right. Exactly. And then, of course, you've got detection dogs, which are doing amazing jobs. Um, but, you know, they can't really access the, the vents of containers higher up. And then if you imagine a big shipping port where the containers are actually placed, often they're stacked on top of one of another, you know, to these like really, really high levels. So that's where we think our rats can come in and help um, and be added to, to that team, um, you know, to, to fill that gap um, and, and, and offer another, you know, way of screening these containers. Absolutely. And, uh, and a very practical way of doing it as well. I mean, I imagine at some point we'll have a lot of rats in the port, basically working nonstop, crawling around, trying to detect all this. They could also do yeah. it, I guess, with uh, drugs, right? And certain other materials. So if you're smuggling drugs yes. or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we already know that our rats can be trained on TNT for the landmines. Um, and so far, what we've seen is that if a dog can be trained on it, so can a rat. Um, and of course, there are narcotics dogs. Um, you have wildlife you know, there's also a lot of human trafficking happening with these shipping containers. Um, so the opportunities are endless. Um, I think, you know, right now we're focusing on wildlife um, and, and we'll see where it goes from there. You know, a lot of this is also developing the methodologies of how to deploy our rats. How, how do we bring them into right. the port safely? How do we build something that then brings my rat up to this vent? Right, um, right. Yeah, all of these things. How much time does it take to, to train a rat from the time they're born? Or, and how, how long does a, a rat live? I don't even, I'm like, I'm clueless <laughs> when it comes to, to rats. And you have really opened my eyes. And I'm sure you have opened everyone's eyes to, the, to, to consider rats in a different way. I think they have like a negative connotation in our society sometimes. Yeah. But it seems that they're amazing animals. And, and they can be incredibly helpful. We could work with them uh, probably a lot more than with dogs even. Yeah. Um, so the, the species of rat we work with is called the African giant pouch rats. It's native here to East Africa. 
Um, and one of the reasons we work with them is because they have a long lifespan. So the average lifespan of these rats in the wild is seven to eight years, mm -hmm. which means once we've invested in you know, training them for some time, they then have a working lifespan ahead of them. Um, and of course, that's an important point. You know, you don't want to invest all this time training them. And six months later, you're at, you know, dies of, of natural causes because that's just the lifespan of it. Um, they, they're called pouch rats because they, they're quite closely related to hamsters, actually. They've got these big cheek pouches that they will stuff their food in. So it's very, very <laughs> cute. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's the, the species that we work with. Um, in terms of how long it takes to train them, it kind of depends on the project. Um, it also depends a bit on the rat. Um, we have rats that are super fast learners and rats that are average learners um, <laughs> or that take a bit longer. Um, um, you know, with the new projects, we don't know yet because we are still developing this. So a lot of it is, you know, we're coming up with this method and we're like, okay, I think training them that way is going to work. And then, of course, whilst you are applying these methodologies, you realize, oh, actually, this doesn't work right. and we need to change it over. So, you know, the, the, the end result is hopefully going to, you know, be one that's very effective. But right now we are developing this. So there's a lot of trial and error and um, also, you know, different avenues and different groups of like, OK, here with these, this group of rats, we're focusing on this part and this group are focusing on this part. Um, yeah. It's it's exciting, right? It sounds like the the future is bright. It sounds that like we haven't really uncovered much of what they can do. So the potentials out there, it sounds like. And I wanted to tell you, ask you a little bit about uh, three particular uh, characters: Barack, Ronin, and Carolina. How how can someone adopt a rat? Well, first and foremost, what who are they, and uh, <laughs> how can someone adopt? Why are you promoting this at all? So. Baraka, Rono, and Carolina are our um, adoption rats. Um, so the, these are rats that are out there and doing the work. Um, and you can adopt them by sponsoring them, um, which, you know, as an NGO, um, we, we rely on funding from um, government organizations as well as private donors. Um, and, and one way to support our work is by sponsoring a rat, um, which you can do on our website. You go on apopo.org, um, makes a great gift. <laughs> if you you know Absolutely. want to surprise someone um and yeah and you can follow them along and get some updates on how they're doing and what they are finding and um how they are helping in your mind and um changing gears a little bit here um and of course we'll put all this note all these comments and links on our on our note section so the people that are listening to us and want to help you make a positive impact in the world please go ahead check it out i've been to the website the videos are incredibly interesting and very cute and uh why wouldn't you just sponsor a rat and then have that rat help uh so many people around the world so we'll put all that so that people can visit your website as well and hopefully we'll we'll be uh helping you as well the um well in in, in your mind what has i mean it's basically a project that you're leading what do you think has been the biggest challenge launching such a unique application for, for our rats? I mean, what some of the things like have really been challenging? There are lots of different challenges related to different areas. Um, you know, one of them is that we are developing something completely new. Um, we haven't worked with shipping ports before, so creating those relationships. You know, we've got some operational trials scheduled actually at the seaport in Dar es Salaam here in Tanzania. So setting up these initial, um, not just relationships, but also connect, you know, letting people, um, getting people to agree to let you into the port with rats. Right, right. <laughs> like, hey there. Yeah, sounds like a, We sounds would like, like to a... bring all of our rats in and then, you know, people are like, okay. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. So, yeah, um, so that's definitely something that, you know, we, we had to work on and that that was new to to me personally. Um, um, but, you know, luckily, Apopo has worked with a lot of different government organizations in the past. And, um, you know, we are based here at the um, Sokoa University of Agriculture. So we are integrated really well um, with the uni here, um, which, which definitely helps um, and, and is a great relationship that we have with them. Um, something else that I think is quite challenging is to try and think um, with, you know, the purpose of a sense of smell. Um, humans, we, we rely on our sight a lot. 
And of course we can smell, um, but it's not our primary sense. So to now come up with training and, and consider potential problems of a sense that isn't our primary sense can be difficult. Um, you know, we have to, and our rats are so sensitive that, you know, even touching one thing and then touching the other means you could have brought over this contamination of scent of the molecules um, and our rats will pick up on that. And then you're looking at like, why are you indicating this one? It's not the right one. Oh, like, I oh, touched it. I've touched it. Yeah. Wow. So there are a lot of things that we are just not so primed and used to considering um, and, and, that takes some, you know, getting used to and, and, and training and getting into the material of, you know, this is what you're working with now. And you always have to think with your different senses. Um, so that, I never, that, never that, thought of that. That seems, uh, seems like an incredible challenge to have because you got to train all this, the rats uh, without you really being able to do it. I mean, you don't understand how deep their yeah. sense of smell is. I mean, we no. will never get it, get it. Uh, yeah, that's, no. That's interesting. Well, th this, I mean, thank you so much. This has been an amazing mm -hmm. interview. What you guys are doing is incredible. I definitely think that the future of uh, preventing some of these things and helping uh, people through surveillance and through uh, just landmines and tuberculosis and maybe tons of other potential applications in the future will be very impactful. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And thank you for giving me the time mm -hmm. to connect and talk. Um, how could our listeners connect to you and, and learn a little bit more about what you do? So you can learn lots and lots and lots on our website. Um, you can learn about the different projects. You can adopt the rat there. Um, you, we're also on social media. Um, so you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, there's lots and lots of very cute content of our rats stuffing bananas into their cheek pouches. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you need to pick me up um and you know also updates about our projects and how they are going so yeah that's the best way perfect and um so for you you mentioned it before i mean sponsoring uh one of these acute little rats is a really good way of helping well, how other ways could people out there help a popo uh, you need the money you need you need the funding to do this and i think it's a very very good return on anyone's investment because you're helping save lives basically so um how, how else can people help you i think just spreading the word is always a good one um you know you said it yourself earlier rats don't always get the best rep um so you know creating this awareness of actually they're, they're doing really good stuff um is is a great thing you know to appreciate them a bit more um especially if we're, you know, thinking about things like our search and rescue rats, we've had some reactions of people be like, oh, God, imagine you in this collapsed building and, and trapped and now a rat turns up and your face is the last thing I want to see. Right. You know? So just, um, you know, just this awareness of this is what you want to see. Like, you know, you, you're not going to be dreaming and delu delusional. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a speaking rat now. Um you know, that, that, that awareness and just spreading the word and sharing our posts, um, that, that always helps. Absolutely. And uh, we'll definitely make sure to help you kind of promote and also help you in any other way we can, because this is an incredible organization. It has been a delightful conversation. And for everyone that's listening out there, just go to the website. Once you see these rats wearing the backpacks and, and the cameras, you'll see that they're a lot cuter than you imagine they'll be. And uh, cute or not, they're saving lives so uh, let's definitely support if we can thank you ec so much thank you for everyone listening if you enjoy conversations like the, the one we just had with ec please be sure to subscribe thank you so much and have a good day